Well, welcome to the next symposium. Okay, next up is Toric IOL with intraocular pinhole, a paradigm shift in the treatment of keratoconus by Bruno Trinidadji. So I'd like to start off by thanking the ASCRS for putting up this virtual meeting uh, in, with, with such a short notice in these unprecedented times. And especially the ASCRS Cataract Committee for uh, responsible for this symposium. I thank you for the opportunity of presenting this case here. And I hope everyone is home safe. Um, so this is a case that illustrates a paradigm shift in our, in our view in the treatment of keratoconus. And this case is especially interesting because it illustrates two very important principles of this new approach. I don't have any financial interest to declare, but my brother and co-author has a license contract with the manufacturer of this pinhole. And, and this pinhole is not FDA approved. So this is a 41-year-old man that has committed at least a decade of his life trying to improve his vision. He has keratoconus and has undergone corneal cross-linking and intracorneal ring segments implantation, as well as many trials of contact lenses, including scleral lenses. But despite all his effort, his uncorrected vision is still very poor. And although a corneal graft has been extensively discussed with him, he completely refused that idea. It does improve a bit with refraction, but not to a, an extent that pleases him or satisfy his needs. And with the pinhole occluder, it improves even further. So we decided to perform uh, a different surgery. We did a clear lens extraction followed by the implantation of a low-powered IOL together with the extra-focused pinhole in the ciliary sulcus, and this is how the eye looks at the end of surgery. And four months after this procedure, this patient had a significant improvement of vision. He now sees 2020 best corrected, and this is his refraction. However, he cannot tolerate these spectacles because of an isoconia and also some ghosting he refers to. So after extensive discussion, we decided to uh, perform a, another surgery. And this time we would do an IOL exchange under the intraocular pinhole to a toric lens. So doing surgery, we removed the pinhole from the sulcus. This can be easily performed, not hard at all. And then using dispersive viscoelastic with a bent needle, uh, we reopened the capsular bag and with blunt dissection, we carefully dissected the IOL out of the bag into the interior chamber. We folded it and explanted it. We then use a capsular tension ring to ensure a complete capsular opening and better force distribution to the equator of the bag. And then a high seal toric implant was used and positioned inside the capsular bag and aligned in the proper meridian. And then we reimplanted the intraocular pinhole. And this time we positioned it inside the capsular bag. And this is the aspect at the end of surgery. And the following day was one of those memorable days. This patient referred an unprecedented vision of 2016, uncorrected vision. He was thrilled. And after pupil dilation, we could see both implants very well centered. And using a modified slit lamp with an infrared camera, we could see the toric marks of the uh, uh, toric implant behind the black pinhole perfectly aligned. So. We, we, we find this a paradigm shift in the way we, we deal with keratoconus and the use of a toric implant together with the pinhole may improve vision quite significantly in these very desperate patients. So we're proposing here a clear lens extraction together with the implantation of an intraocular lens that obviously will, will address the high and moderate myopia that these patients usually present with as well as the astigmatism in case we use, we decide to use a toric implant. 
And on top of that, we implant the pinhole, which addresses the high order aberrations of these eyes. And we performed this in 69 eyes. And in about a third of these patients, we used a toric implant. And the results couldn't have been better. The visual results are outstanding. So these patients usually improve from around 2,800 to roughly 2,030 uncorrected after this procedure. And as you can see, this is a long lasting uh, result. So who are the ideal candidates for this approach? So first thing of is the keratoconus must be stable. So you can either wait for the keratoconus to stabilize or perform corneal cross-linking uh, in, in that sense, but uh, the keratoconus must be stable. Second point is the central cornea must be transparent. Any signs of cornea opacity, uh, central cornea opacity will compromise the results. In terms of ectasia positioning, the more central the ectasia, ectatic area is, the better the results are. So we, we, we prefer to operate on patients which present uh, central forms of corneoectasia, as well as mean keratometry under 65 diopters. So this is a procedure not, not suited for those very advanced cases of keratoconus, as well as patients with larger pupils. So the larger the pupil, the more infected these patients are by the higher order, order aberrations and the more uh, improvement they notice after this procedure. So the take home points here is this is a procedure for contact lens intolerant patients. And this is what we believe to be a paradigm shift in the way we, we face keratoconus is a lens based approach to treat keratoconus. And obviously, we, we need to reinforce that a careful retinal examination preoperatively is mandatory in proper counseling of these patients postoperatively as well. And the, the quest for emetropia must persist in these patients. And the use of toric implants may improve these results even further in a certain number of patients. And with this, I conclude my presentation, and I thank you all for your attention. Wow, Bruno, that was, uh, that was an amazing case. I, I counted five pieces of hardware, uh, two in <laughs> one capsule tension ring, uh, a pinhole lens, and a toric lens in the end. Uh, a lot yep. of hardware, but the results were amazing. Yep. So I have a couple questions for you. So, so one is you, you, you've got the, you've got the pinhole lens sitting on top of the toric lens. Um, you must have had to think about, am I going to have any difficulty aligning the toric lens behind the pinhole lens? Um, did you encounter any difficulty with it rotating after you put the pinhole lens in? No, actually, what, what we normally do is bef uh, after implanting the toric lens, we align it and we aspirate the, the OVD behind the toric implant. And that pretty much sits the toric IOL in, in the proper position. And then after that, we, we, we implant the pinhole over it. So it's usually not, not a problem in terms of rotating the toric lens after we implant the pinhole. Second concern, this would be a long-term concern, is now you have two lenses in the bag. Uh, any, any thoughts uh, about interlenticular opacification down the road? Yeah, that's a great question. As a matter of fact, we are presenting a paper in this meeting uh, addressing that question. And we've analyzed, uh, I, I think, 65 eyes, uh, and our, our uh, mean follow-up was about two years. And we, that, that, I mean, these 65 eyes had two implants, the, the black pinhole and a, a normal uh, IOL behind it inside the capsular bag. And in all of these patients, we did not see any signs of interlenticular uh, opacification. And we believe that, that the, the, the vaulting uh, of this pinhole, the, the meniscus shape that vaults over the eye well, together with the pinhole that allows uh, aqueous flow through the pinhole, uh, might be responsible for the, the non-formation of these interlenticular membrane in these cases. Great. Tal, do you have any, uh, any questions or thoughts uh, regarding this case? Yeah, I thought it was a beautiful case. You know, small aperture optics are something we're seeing a lot of as well. We started with an FDA-approved camera inlay. We know Europe and other countries have an IOL. But a focus lens makes us all envious, of course. Um, 
cases of keratoconus that you showed just brilliantly are, are really great for these small aperture optics, high order aberrations, but also lower aberrations like astigmatism. My question is, uh, you know, I find for the last three years we've debated whether we could put toric eye wells, and I find that I use a ton of toric eye wells in these keratoconic patients to debulk the astigmatism. I was interested to see you only use it a third of the time. I guess we have a pinhole, you don't have to. Why didn't you use a toric eye well first in this one? Well, uh, th that's a very important question as well. And I guess that's the, 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 the importance of this case, because this case, we obviously didn't, didn't plan to, to switch lenses in this case, but this case illustrates very well the importance of, of the toric implant since we, we switched it uh, into, uh, and it did improve quite a bit the vision. And uh, basically, but before we were kind of learning the, 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 the learning our way through this, this small ap aperture optics in these cases of keratoconus. And what we've seen is that uh, toric implants, they do help a lot in a significant number of patients. And uh, I, I think this is a case that illustrates that point uh, very well. Uh, Jonathan, if, if this patient had come to you and uh, let's say they were unhappy, they're obviously they're very happy, but let's say they were, they had a residual refractive error um, and just couldn't wear glasses to correct that. And you've got a T9 lens in the eye now. What would you do as your next step? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's actually what I wanted. One question I wanted to ask Bruno is if any of the patients in his series came in really basically hard contact lens dependent for good visual acuity. So we've all been burned or, or know about uh, these patients and trying to correct them with toric IOLs when they, they actually need the contact lens, either scleral or gas permeable, to correct their irregular astigmatism. So I was wondering yeah, well, about that, that. That's absolutely a good point. And, and uh, I, I think we try to, to, uh, to point that out as well. Uh, this procedure is reserved for contact lens intolerant patients. Uh, we, we should not, we, I mean, we, we, we're not recommending this procedure at this stage for uh, a contact lens uh, uh, tolerant patients. So patients that, that uh, do well with contact lenses. So these patients are patients that cannot wear contact lenses, that contact lenses are, are completely out of the questions, uh, out of question uh, in terms of their visual rehabilitation. So they're basically, the choice here is between something like that or a corneal transplant uh, a dark or, or a penetrating graft that, uh, in our view, it's probably a lot more, a lot more uh, unpredictable results with probably uh, uh, worse uh, complications and, and uh, um, more uh, um, uh, real, less reliable, probably. Nicole, any quick thoughts? We're getting close to the end, but any quick thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think three days a week, I want this lens. Um, so I am so excited about this. Um, any tips on centration? So do you use a coaxial light? It's a 1.3 millimeter opening. Um, it is a 1.3, yes. So can yeah. you give us so, a tip on that? Yeah, so what we normally do, we try to center this uh, in the first Purkinje reflex. Uh, but uh, what we've seen is that when we, when we put this implant in the ciliary sulcus, it tends to, to, to find its way in, in, into a place where we, we may not have a, a perfect control over it in terms of centration. At the end of surgery, these implants, they might look centered, but uh, post-operatively, uh, they, they may be centered. And this is one of the reasons that we are, we are now implanting these uh, uh, lenses, or I mean, the, the, technically not a lens, but we're using these implants inside the capsule bag because they tend to center much better when they're inside the capsule bag, uh, especially long term, uh, in, in the long term. Thank you all. Kendall, we'll catch you on the next panel. Sorry for the, the short. Um, but thank you very much for a very, very interesting case. Listen, uh, we're now going to move into voting. And I'm not, not exactly sure how this is going to work because I don't see it from the audience perspective. But on your screen, there should be a, uh, a, a voting tool. And we have uh, seven speakers. And uh, uh, vote your favorite uh, teaching video. Well, we have a winner, and um, 
Uh, this was a super clean video and uh, just amazing, uh, amazing final results. And uh, so the winner is Bruno Trinidadji. Hey, congratulations, Bruno. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you Excellent so much. What, we learned a lot from this one. This was a this was phenomenal at so many levels. Thank, thank you so much for the whole opportunity, and thank you for putting up the the, the whole symposium and for coordinating this this amazing meeting. It, it was great participating on this, and it's I, I'm extremely honored to receive this award. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, you're welcome. Well, we, we wish we could give you the golden apple, but it's going to be the golden <laughs> apple card this time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that in, in, in honor of the good. digital meeting that we're all having, <laughs> digital digital <laughs> prize. But uh, congratulations and uh, uh, excellent video, uh, and, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be up on the on the ASRS website for everybody to enjoy in the years to come. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for coming.